Welcome everybody. We're back with another Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast slash vidcast. And joining me today are Michael Taylor. Hi Michael. Lindsay Powell. Hello. Hi, Lindsay. Hello. And Joshua Brouwers. Hello. Joshua. Hello. Hello. Um, today we're discussing Ancient Warfare issue 6-6. Six, six. We're behind a little bit. Um, entitled Attack of the Celts. And we've got a little introduction right here. Now, it is important right off the bat to note that the Celts did not identify themselves as a single people or culture in the same way that, say, the Greeks did. There was no pan-Celtic identity, although some tribes did form local alliances and regional confederacies. Indeed, the Celts were in some ways constructed twice by outsiders, first through the crude lens of ancient ethnography, and again through the modern enthusiasms of national historians, particularly the French and the Irish. Nonetheless, I will say that we can make some generalizations about the Celtic peoples of the ancient world. They spoke an Indo-European language descended from Proto-Celtic and possessed certain shared cultural characteristics, including, with admittedly some exceptions, a broad geographic band of material culture referred to by archaeologists as Latin. Now, the origins of the Celts are obscure. Although certain archaeologists and linguists today favor the notion that Celtic spread more through linguistic and cultural osmosis rather than through violent migration and invasion. Despite linguistic and cultural similarities, Celtic Europe was characterized by vast diversity. In the military sphere, for example, warriors in Britain still fought mounted on chariots into the first century AD. Now, chariots were common in early Iron Age graves, and Celtic tribesmen in northern Italy fought with chariots in the early 200s BC. But by the time Caesar invaded Britain, most other Celtic peoples had abandoned chariots and were instead renowned for their prowesses as cavalrymen. Now, Celtic tribes did, on occasion, join forces together, a process assisted by linguistic similarities and cultural affinities. In the 220s BC, for example, the Insubres of northern Italy recruited a large number of Gallic warriors from across the Alps to aid them in their fight against Rome. Now, before we delve into the podcast, I want to consider three ways of looking at the Celt in the ancient world. The first is the Celt as nemesis. The second is the Celt as mercenary. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we should consider the Celt as victim. Now, certainly, the Greeks and Romans of the Hellenistic world viewed Celtic peoples as terrifying barbarian opponents. Two historical events lay at the heart of Mediterranean fears. The most dramatic was the Celtic invasion of Greece in 279 BC. Prompted by a major migration of Celtic peoples, these invaders defeated and killed the king of Macedonia, Ptolemy Caranus, and inflicted significant destruction before crossing the Hellespont and settling in central Anatolia. That being said, the primary modality of Celtic warfare in the Mediterranean came not in the form of invasion or raiding, but through mercenary service for the more politically and economically advanced states to the south. Finally, we should consider the Celt as victim. While stereotyped as vicious warriors, Celtic people often found themselves the victims of horrifying depredations. Grim admiration of Gallic suffering is on display in perhaps the most famous Hellenistic sculpture, the Dying Gaul, in which a mortally wounded, nude Galatian warrior lies supine, stoically waiting for death to overtake him. Its companion piece, the so-called Ludovici Gaul, depicts a defeated Galatian stabbing himself with great bravado, having already slain his wife. He chooses a noble death before enslavement. But the sculptor chose to highlight the patient suffering of the Celtic victim over the barbarian terror of the Celtic menace. All right, after this introduction of a very large topic, we should perhaps go through the articles that were in the issue real quick. It's quite a few this time. 
Um, starts, of course, with a historical introduction by, surprise, Michael Taylor. We have an article about um, the Boudican Revolt, and uh, specifically our Roman sources for this revolt. Uh, then we go to the defense of Iron Age British fortresses by Lindsay Powell. But then we have an article by Arnold Bloomberg about Celtic warriors uh, fighting for Carthage in the Second Punic War. We have, of course, and we, we had to go there um, after six years of ancient warfare, we have the last stand of Vercingetorix at Alesia with a really wonderful, I have to say, very popular centerfold picture. And then we have Celtic defeat at Delphi by Eric Anderson, an article about the um, sculptures from uh, southern France. A big topic, the Celts. So after this brief um, walkthrough of the issue, we can perhaps start our debate by going back to the questions that Michael posed in his video introduction, namely uh, the three roles or the three aspects of the Celtic warriors. Uh, first, the Celtic menace, then Celtics, uh, Celts as mercenaries, and finally the Celts as victims. Uh, to start with the Celtic menace, probably the best known role aspect of the Celts. Um, Michael, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, certainly when you look at the ancient sources, they treat the Celts as primarily this uh, very, uh, at times, monstrous, dangerous threat. Um, and it's interesting that this is uh, both in the Greek world and the Roman world. The uh, Celtic sack of Rome is uh, sort of a fundamental to Roman uh, myth history, and, and Celtic incursions are very much feared through a lot of the early Republic. And then the um, Celtic uh, sack of uh, Delphi, an, an invasion of Greece, which um, very few people see coming, so it's a very sudden, uh, and it seems quite significant and uh, devastating invasion. Um, this also um, becomes fundamental for, in the Hellenistic world, treating the Celts as this um, other that needs to be defeated. So uh, if you're a Hellenistic king, uh, one of the ways you prove that you are capable of defending your realm is you find some Celts and uh, bash them around a little bit and then, you know, celebrate that victory. Um, so uh, for uh, both the Romans and, and uh, amongst the Hellenistic uh, kingdoms, um, there's a lot of... Um, state propaganda related to um, defeating the Celts, and of course perhaps the most famous piece of propaganda is, is Caesar's Gallic Wars, where he, he proves that he can triumph over this um, you know, traditional uh, uh, menace or enemy. Yeah, yeah, taking up that theme, the impression I have, being a Celt myself, being from Wales, um, is that in a sense that the one characteristic that the Celts as a community, a, a very loose-knit community, because I think the one thing is the Celts are a product of the classical imagination, the Greek and the Roman imagination. As the article in, introducing the magazine says, the Celts themselves didn't call them that. I mean, the Keltoi, Kelti, whatever, uh, were whatever their tribal names were, and they formed alliances and they bickered with each other, and sometimes they, they maintained a sort of stalemate peace. But in the, in the sort of classical Mediterranean um, imagination, they were a menace because they probably were not understood. They were the typical barbarian. They spoke a language or languages which were nothing like their own. Uh, and I think they, they probably understood that they were technologically advanced, but they represented a sort of force for chaos. They, they didn't live like other Mediterranean peoples in organized towns with grid streets and so on. Well, a lot of them did, but that didn't suit the Roman imagination much. And, and I think that when, when Julius Caesar goes out and beats the Celts in, in, in Gaul, uh, he plays that up because the, he's, in a sense, he's dealt with the Al-Qaeda of his day. Uh, he's taken them out. Of course, they, are, they aren't eliminated completely because, uh, as I discuss in my, my own book about Drusus, um, the whole chunk of the central Alpine region going into southern Germany and northern Italy was itself a, a, a Celtic stronghold. The, the Raiti, the Noriki, and so on were themselves Celts. And it took them another 50, 100 years to conquer them. So uh, they were sort of an ever-present menace for, for quite a long part of the Greek and the Roman history, and I think it comes down to that they had formed in their imaginations this this this, this uh, terrifying barbarian figure, and no doubt when they carved that statue of the quelled Gaul, there must have been a sort of wry smile that that was that was how they liked to imagine that they would always one day be. And it was perhaps fortunate for all those conquering Romans that they managed to find new Celts for a couple hundred years, because um, of course after Caesar, you're right. Yeah, Augustus finds them 
in the Alps, uh, and, and then Claudius has more luck, finds some more, and just has to go overseas. Well, they become a sort of a convenient uh, scapegoat in, in, in a sense for lots of lots of ills. Yes, you can pick on them and you can beat them up, and and, and they they seem to uh, give you a good fight. And, and precisely because they're not terribly well organised, I mean, they can be overcome. Witness the conquest of uh, of, of Celtic Britain. I, interestingly, though, that there are times when they do form in, uh, unions. I mean, look at the uh, that the Kimbri and the Teutones, for example, at the time of Caius Marius and Sulla. That was a shocking defeat for the Romans at uh, Aquae Sextiae finally culminating in uh, uh, Wercali, which we've covered in another issue. So, you know, they gave the Romans and the Greeks a, a run for their money, and I dare say that, um, that when they could finally eradicate them, if, if that's a possibility, but more actually assimilate them, uh, that there was probably a national sense of achievement. I think certainly the, the theme of Celt as uh, menace is directly linked to the other theme of Celt as victim, that because Celts are constructed as this um, really terrible barbarian other. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans uh, do terrible things to Celtic people, who in some instances are, yeah, are not really actually able to um, defend themselves, simply because that's, you know, that's how you treat uh, you know, this, this awful menace. Um, perhaps not completely dissimilar, say, to the ways that um, in uh, the you know, 19th century United States, um, uh, Native Americans were constructed as these sort of ferocious and at times savage um, warriors, and that's helps justify, you know, going in and, uh, and uh, killing them or driving them off and, and taking their land. So in, in some ways it's very unfortunate for the Celts that they were perceived as so terrifying and terrible. Um, it le leads to a lot of uh, Celtic uh, suffering and misfortune. Well, in taking up that theme, Michael, I, I was interested in, in the introductory piece that you were talking about how the, the, the Celts were presented as, as basically uh, bashing brains of children and this sort of thing. And I actually found that, again, within the context of the Rice in Norican War, and it does seem to be a sort of stereotype that these people are beyond the pale of, of civilization. Um, they are that devoid of morals, if you will, that uh, rather than do the decent thing and surrender and become one of us, what they do is they will smash their own children against uh, rocks, and their women will, you know, slay themselves, and, and will even try and seek people who are, I think it's uh, pregnant women particularly, so that they can, you know, they can be ended. So it, it, it again plays to this idea. It's almost a sort of uh, dare I coin a sort of um, a Halloween image of, a, of another people. It's a fantasy, really, they've created. Well, it's a propagandic idea so that's created and that's repeated over and over and over again. Yeah, and yet the amazing thing is that, that the way that they respond to assimilation is quite informative. So, for example, uh, in the case of the Gallic uh, Celts, of which there were many, of course, there's famously three Gauls. Um, the ones in the Deep South assimilated into the Roman Empire quite early, uh, benefited quite a lot, in fact are the most Romanized all through the Roman period, uh, Alange and, and these other the famous Nîmes, Arles, these sorts of places. Uh, but the, for the further north and west you go, particularly the west you go, the more difficult it becomes to import and impregnate the culture there with the idea of urbanization, settled towns, villas and this sort of thing. It, it seems to be in the center of the country and going north that they have more success. Finally, with the Treveri and some of these other people, you get the great cities along the, the Rhine in the end. Uh, and then when you get to, for example, Britain, again, there's very, very different adoptions of the Roman way when you get there. So there's some evidence to suggest that the Romans were already active well before the Claudian conquest mm -hmm. uh, in the south of Britain. And we've seen, for example, recently in Silchester, that uh, the proto silchester the, the, the Verican uh, Atribatic, uh, so just in fact was probably a gridiron town, uh, very sophisticated, probably square post buildings, something that the Romans would have recognized in fact. And uh, what, what, what is indicative is therefore certain of the, the nation states, if you can call them, the nationes, uh, were akin to uh, and more uh, able to assimilate a Roman way because they'd been too exposed to it. And then you get the other ones, for example, like the Brigantes, the Salures, the or uh, do case and so on, and Dumnoni in far northwestern and uh, Welsh Britain, uh, who decidedly say they're not going to be assimilated. And in fact, there's quite a lot of evidence that says once you get outside the forts and the Roman towns, there are fewer villas, and in fact, the mm. Celtic lifestyle continues for centuries. Uh, I think what you have there is is perhaps perhaps a couple things 
coming together that that maybe blur the image. Of course, on the one hand, you have we, we've I think we've discussed this before. Um, certainly been argued in ancient warfare and of course in Edge of Empire before that in the Roman idea, the further away you go from Rome, the more barbaric, wild, and and untamed the landscape will get, and therefore the people are. So logically. Um, Celts who live close to the Mediterranean are a lot more civilized than Celts who live further away from the Mediterranean. But the archaeological evidence actually yeah, yeah. supports it. Uh, that, so that's, there's, there's that, a famous that's, town on, at Bordeaux, for example, which the Roman town surveyors laid out, which was never occupied. There is archaeological evidence for it, but then that, that's probably the other aspect, is that um, you know the towns, in, for instance, in southeastern Britain, would have had a much uh, better, uh, would have been much better located for um, early trade with um, Gallic France. Uh, it's just a, it's you know their their trade communication play an enormous role in uh, in the spread of civilization or and certainly of Romanization as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, you know towns like you know, Londinium along the Thames is much more easily reach than um, some fortress out in the sticks uh, in the northwest of Britain. But I think there's another dimension to this, which I think is that, that there is a robustness to the nominally whatever it's called Celtic civilization itself. I mean, these people were very advanced from a point of view of, of law and uh, culture, art culture, manufacturing of, for example, weapons. I mean, they, they, they do some of the most exquisite uh, metalwork in the ancient world uh, by any reckoning and comparison. Um, but I also think that they, they have a robustness which means that they, they don't need anybody else really to copy. That, that they are independent minded and for example the Brigantes in the further north are an indication of that. Even when the Romans are there and they have to basically militarize most of northern Britain and Wales uh, and there's lots of contact assumedly. You find that really into the 70s, 80s and even here I think at the time of Septimius Severus uh, I think there's supposed to be a Brigantic uprising there are clearly communities which refuse, point blank, to be assimilated. And, and, and I have to say that's probably because uh, whatever they saw in this other culture, they didn't want to be part of. I would like to do two points, basically. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the victimization. Um, one of the things that the, the Celts are portrayed as, as stereotypical barbarians, of course. Uh, but they're also portrayed as nobles in the sense of noble savages, like you also had with the uh, Native Americans, for example, at some point, uh, because just beating an enemy that has no redeeming values at all would be uh, not quite an accomplishment. That's one thing. It, it comes forward in the articles, I think. I just wanted to mention it in the podcast also. Uh, and the second thing about um, the, the cultural standards of the Celts, uh, that's something that I think the introduction does very well in, in making clear that there is no big monoculture as far as the Celts are concerned. And also the metalwork, um, I find a little problematic to, to say that Celtic metalwork is very good because it's very dependent on specific uh, times and places. And a lot of the metalwork is actually Mediterranean inspired for the most part. Because also, for example, the famous Gunderstrup uh, cauldron from uh, Denmark. Um, that's probably Thracian import, they think now, rather than Celtic. Okay, I may, I may concede some points on that, but again, you, you've kind of, in a sense, counted the point yourself. It, 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 that's the current thought, and it'll be changed next week by somebody else who's got another thought. Um, and, and yes, it may be context driven. So, for example, Slim uh, D in Wales, uh, where you've got evidence of people throwing things in lakes, which is to be a, a very Celtic thing to do, uh, clearly locally made. And there was no Roman influence because it was so far away. Uh, so I, I think what you do see is that there is a there is a an, an amazing uh, skill among certain people who are very highly regarded artisans in their community. Uh, well, 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 so far away is is not usually uh, something that can be brought forth as an argument. I think if you look at the uh, the famous uh, princess's tomb, I think it is in in Vix in France that has a, a Spartan sixth century cauldron. There. All right, well, let me throw this one out your back of it because we're getting into some meaty stuff, but this is good. Um, one indicator would be, for example, coin hoards. The, the interesting thing is if, you, if we take Britain as, as our example here, uh, coin use is common amongst the Cantiaki in Kent, all the way across the southeast through the uh, Trinovantes, the, 
uh, Atribat is all the way down the Dunoni, even uh, Corialtavi up in up in the north. But once you get past that, there are no coins in Wales. There are no mm -hmm. coins north of the Brigantes. There are no coins north of that. So, so there are parts of the world which do not have those, and coins are very transportable. They're very desirable, and they're so desirable that these Celtic peoples mimic them. They copy them. They even use the Latin alphabet. So I'm saying that the Welsh tribes, and I speak as a Welshman, um, for whatever reason saw no value, don't have any, don't intend to use any, and in fact when the Romans arrive, resist. They don't want to be part of it. Karatakos is in fact, he ends by rallying the Welsh tribes in a in an attempt to, to, and that's why I say I go back to this idea of a robustness of, Kel of Celtic culture, or some of them anyway, um, that uh, are not at all impressed by, cult uh, by Mediterranean culture. There's nothing that they want. I, I mean, I, I think that, that that's where it is important to it, just emphasize the utter diversity of uh, of the Celts. And of course, Wales. There are there maybe are some other factors beyond just cultural factors. And Wales traditionally, because of its geography, is uh, Sort of has weak links to the rest of the British mainland, um, and that's simply because it's got hills and it's it's hard to um, assert the kinds of state control that uh, the, you know the Romans try, but the links remain weak. The the English will try, and uh, so on and so forth. So that that may be. I mean, Wales is certainly has its own kind of probably both cultural and geographic uniqueness, but um, certainly the diversity is everywhere. I mean, even looking at um, you know the various. Tri tribes that Caesar is conquering. There, you know, Caesar talks about two brothers, Dumnorix and uh, Dewitiacus, and uh, uh, one, uh, Dewitiacus, is a druid, and he is a enthusiastic collaborator. Um, goes to Rome, meets Cicero, um, impresses everybody with his sort of uh, divination lore, and then his brother Dumnorix is um, an ardent, um, uh, 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 very much opposed to growing Roman control, and ultimately uh, uh, is killed for it. Um, and so this is even within one family. There's significant disagreements about resistance or or collaboration. And certainly, many Celts do choose collaboration and uh, do like the do like the the uh, some of the kind of things that the Romans uh, have to offer the. The Celtic nobility. I, I think that's that's where the diversity is is, is kind of a, a keyword with the, with the Celts there. There are certainly going to be people that like material things because who doesn't? And if I could draw an analogy, there are lots of people in in parts where there's not necessarily direct American or European influence to still crave to have material belongings from those cultures, but in fact don't want to actually be either European or American. Um, so I think you'll always get some element of that. Uh, and certainly there are cases where you'd have a split. So for example, the Sugambri who are nominally a German tribe, but in fact they're not. They're, they're, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the leader of the, of the tribe who actually is responsible for the Lollian disaster and then goes all the way through Drusus the Elder. Uh, his brother, Dudorix, for example, decides not to surrender, which is what his brother does, um, and in fact splits the Sugambri and half of them go into Germany much deeper and the other half is transferred over to live near Xanthan. Uh, so, it, so it does reflect in those sorts of um, you know, cultural rifts. It can be very locally determined and can also change in the course of time. If you look at, at ancient Greece, for example, the Spartans resisted coinage also for the longest time, preferring to use the, uh, the iron spits according to, uh, to tradition. Um, so, the, yeah, p people can be very selective in what they uh, adapt or adopt and what they uh, choose to actively refuse. Because if you just take a few token artifacts that you consider to be primarily Roman and you actively refuse those, then you can say that you maintain your own identity and then claim that you're making swords in the traditions of your four forefathers, uh, whereas you've actually also adopted that from the Romans, for example, and just making that up on the spot. Let's go over to, um, um, fr from assimilation to and resistance to the Celts as mercenaries, um, which really, if you think about it, it is also very, it's a very interesting topic because it uh, it starts almost exactly at the same time or very quickly after uh, the Celts first come on the Roman and Greek radars uh, as threats. I mean, uh, after Brennus um, invades Greece and sacks Delphi, it only takes a couple of uh, decades before various Greeks hire Celts to fight other Greeks, and the same thing happens in Italy. Um, yeah, and, and in some ways, you know, maybe the, some of the most important links between Celtic peoples and the sort of greater Mediterranean world is through 
mercenary service. You have Celts who are, in some ways, extremely international uh, individuals who, you know, you, you might be from southern France and all of a sudden you spend time in Sicily and Carthage and, um, and uh, Syria simply because of, uh, you know, kind of transnational mercenary uh, service. So uh, on one hand, in terms of Celtic contact with uh, the Mediterranean, mercenary service is really um, essential. And certainly it, it goes to show that for all the complaints about, oh, you know, these terrible, awful Celts, they're, they're so, you know, brutal and terrible and we'd, we'd love to eradicate them, um, uh, Hellenistic kings are, are more than happy to hire them uh, to uh, serve in their armies and uh, defeat their uh, other, you know, uh, Hellenistic enemies. So I guess there's a, there's a bit of a double standard there. Certainly, uh, as mercenaries, um, that, that may be one of the great Celtic contributions to um, ancient warfare. Yeah, and clearly that appealed to certain elements of the, of the society, which was war and war fighting are very desirable activities. There have been wars, the spoils, just the honor of, of, of fighting it is, is very cherished. And it's interesting, for example, in the Welsh Mab in Ogion, I mean, you've got lots of stories of struggles and the Irish... Uh, tales the same thing. It, it really is heroism and and, and willing to fight uh, with great stakes, uh, and in this case, being paid for it, um, it, it is something very interesting. And I think wasn't there recently again in Colchester? I think uh, what what's believed to be a Roman or Celtic helmet, which actually has the bones of a warrior in it. And uh, this is this is presumably because uh, you know a Celt from that area was either going abroad to fight with the other Gauls against Caesar, or maybe another way of looking at it was that he was actually fighting as a mercenary. Yeah, it's an, it's an ongoing topic. I mean, um, you said yourself just now that Sugambri usually seen as um, Germanics. The same can be said for the Batavi, who are uh, usually considered a Germanic tribe, but are so close on the, uh, uh, on the sort of border area between the traditional on the traditional border area between the Celts and Germanics that you really it's very hard to say which cultural group they belong to of course m among the most famous uh, mercenaries and auxiliary soldiers of the Romans later on aren't the Batavi supposed to be a spin-off of the uh, Cati who are really technically yeah. Suebic yeah it's it's a warrior elite that comes here and mix with the local population which is certainly in a on a in a area where the Celts and Germanic peoples mix so it yeah, I agree. I agree. what they remains is is very unclear and they get uh, at least in the beginning they get just get hired into Roman service wholesale it just it you know even Civilis is is still a local prince who just um, who is, is in the army with his retinue mm -hmm. and decides that at one point um, they've had enough of being in Roman service. But that's a well, story for another day. It also hints at the fact that uh, you know, societies like Greek police and, and Rome as a state are quite happy to pay for services in order to get an end met. You know, there's, there's no particular pride in this. It's a, it's a business transaction. You know, you, we'll pay for your bodies. You go fight for us, and uh, you'll join our allies, our Soki, and uh, and we hope we'll win with the additional strength you bring. Yes, and it can be, in fact, very very advantageous to do so. I mean, look at the the pride at Mons Graupius that uh, one group of Celts, uh, if we consider the Batavi Celts, defeats another group uh, without any losses in Roman citizens, mm -hmm. as Tacitus famously says. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest uh, employers in the western Mediterranean is, um, I guess, uh, I guess neither Greek nor Roman, Carthage is actually huge, hires lots of um, Celtic mercenaries from both Celtiberian regions in Spain, um, France, and Hannibal's strategy really rests on recruiting uh, Celts from northern Italy once he's crossed the Alps. So Carthage may be actually one of the um, most prominent employers of, of um, Celtic mercenaries, but certainly in the East, particularly the, the Celts who invade Greece and Delphi in the in 279, cross over the Hellespont, and then end up in what is now referred to as Galatia. Um, those are some of the primary mercenary hires for the uh, Eastern monarchs, the, and particularly the Seleucids, um, make heavy use of these um, Galatians, particularly because this, they're there, they're close by, they have a, a warrior culture. I'm not sure um, that's a bridge to Celts' victim, but um, it, but perhaps a better segue is the famous statue of um, 
a Galatian mercenary being trampled by a, a, an elephant. And uh, that's uh, that's the same era where you know the the Celts become well known mercenaries everywhere. That we also get the first statuettes and um, and big statues of the dying Gauls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I guess I uh, in in the introduction talked about the these famous some of the most famous pieces probably of of Hellenistic artwork uh, that there is the, the dying Gaul and actually part of a, a larger stature group. Um, and made in uh, Pergamon, another Hellenistic kingdom where that dynasty established itself by going out and bashing around the Galatians a little bit. And this, this says, okay, I'm, I'm fit to be king. And uh, so presumably these statues, again, it's, I don't think it's entirely clear, but it's generally believed they're, they're, they commemorate this uh, Gallic victory. Uh, won by um, the Adelaide kings, but it is interesting that it, it um, does not portray the Gauls as, um, you know, sort of savage monsters or, uh, you know, orcs or goblins, you know, they're, they're portrayed as these rather quite, uh, as Joshua mentioned, noble savages, um, you know, willingly uh, accepting their fate and their wounds and their and their death. Um, so it is interesting that it's, it's, a, it's a, in some ways a Hellenistic um, acknowledgement of Celtic suffering, um, of, of which, of course, there there was quite a bit. The Celts oftentimes are on the uh, losing end of a great deal of, um, of uh, Mediterranean warfare. And, and on the other side of that, which with the other side of that particular coin, I think, is that, for example, how uh, the conquering nation just simply catalogues it. So, for example, La Tourbe in the south of France, which is the great monument which was built around about 7 BC, marks it's the period, it's the full stop in the conquest of the Alps. It lists, I think, about 60 tribes. Uh, I think Pliny in, in natural history, I think, uh, rattles them all off. And, and it's like, you know, here we go, all by name, you know, they're all catalogued. Um, and so it's all done, wrapped up, finished. Uh, and then, in, was it, I think, is it Orange? Uh, I can't remember, there's a, there's a, a Roman arch, uh, which mm -hmm. again shows piles of arms and shields and so on. And, and yes, it is the Celtic's victim, but it's a Celtic's war spoil uh, as well. Yeah, you're right. It's, 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 it's very... It's really cataloging. It's it's kind of a a good way to 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 say it. Well, I think what it what it hints at is that, for example, individual Roman consuls that went and led legions and went and went to war, and then later you've got the triumvirs and the Caesars and so on. I mean, they 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 have to report back to their public, don't they? The Senate and the and the people and the people's councils. Uh, and what they love to delight in is that they have the roll call of. You know, Pompey has conquered all these people and set up all these cities and all this, all this wealth I've had, all this plate and money I've brought back. Uh, and it appeals to this sort of Mediterranean mentality. I think it would have been a little bit foreign to the, the Celtic mentality because they, they tend to be more individual rather than this sort of somewhat mon mon monolithic state. Uh, but, but, it, but it suited their temperament to be able to say, as we go expanding across the world, you know, there's this, this like a vacuum cleaner-like approach to just taking these people in. Um, and of course, then you know, what we're left with is, is is this list of people. Very often, we don't know where they are because they're they're obliterated at that point. They're expunged. <laughs> That's the, probably the best point to settle on for those uh, for um, Michael's three characteristics. Yosha, I think you also had some questions you collected on on our Facebook site, right? Yes, I do. Um, I, I asked. Uh, on our Facebook page whether uh, people wanted to have any questions answered by uh, the team. I will just do them in the uh, order that I have them here. Uh, Sebastian Labadie, I hope I said that correctly, said, uh, what were Celtic wars like before the Romans got involved? Well, un un unfortunately we don't have a lot of great um, documentation. Um, we do know that the Celtic people's um, uh, warfare was very central to their culture and in much ways, in many ways, the big changes that happened to a lot of Celtic societies after conquest in part stem from the fact that the Romans no longer allow them to, um, you know, routinely uh, fight amongst each other. Um, a lot of it seems to have been relatively low-level violence, raiding, sort of headhunting does seem to be common amongst some Celtic peoples, um, including some that are visited by Poseidonius in um, and southern was now southern France, so a, a lot of it seems to have been, um, you know, not necessarily enormous, you know, organized battles, but war parties going out, in some ways, kind of engaging in, in what we might call brigandage, what the Romans might call brigandage, but nonetheless, being able to, as a you know Celtic male, 
engage in um, a successful violence uh, was clearly very, very important um, to you know your standing in society. And so, you know, having a going to, having your house and having a little altar full of human heads um, is something that that we know some Celtic peoples did, and um, that was uh, important. But um, again, probably because these were less organized societies, you don't have uh, you know big armies necessarily um, for campaigns for the most part. Well, I'm going to throw this in. I, I think they would have been... Um, look at the weapons, for example. They have long slashing swords. So, the, so we're, we're dealing with some quite elaborate combat um, that they have... Uh, a lot of them don't wear armor at all, so their bodies are exposed. Sometimes they're tattooed or painted. Uh, and they have these uh, quite elaborately decorated shields. I think so what we're, what we're seeing is... is a that's all during the Roman era, though. That's all after 400 BC. That's all... Uh... The, the long slashing swords and, and uh, the big shields. Yeah, the the sort of La Ten one or two sword tends to be uh, pretty short, about about two feet long. And then there's a by La, La Ten three, I think you get uh, the big what we think of it as a big Celtic broadsword. Well, let me ask you the question then: Why why did these swords get longer? I mean, what's interesting is that the the Roman legionary seems to have fairly consistently fought with the short sword until much later in the empire, uh, and the Greeks, of course, had their particular style weapons too, but why did the Celtic weapon evolve to being a longer broadsword then? You know, and obviously that's where it's hard to say. It, it may imply, um, again, a, a kind of looser form of, uh, of uh, infantry where you, you actually want a longer sword because you, you know, are, are not fighting in any kind of really you know, rank-and-file or uh, you know, tactical organization and you're just going around slashing. Um, it may also be the fact that the sword is a status symbol, um, perhaps uh, somewhat akin to sort of uh, locker room envy just got longer, not necessarily for tactical reasons, but for um, display regions. You know, the bunch of chiefs walk into a longhouse and uh, you know, everyone wants to have the longest sword. What you can characterize the, the, the pre-Roman Celtic warfare like, basically, is like what Michael said, skirmishing and probably raiding for cattle and that sort of stuff, more the, the kind of status warfare that you see in a, in a simpler, less complex society. Uh, Hans-Dieter Bader asks, I would like to hear what the team thinks about links between religion and warfare amongst Celtic people, especially in the later Laterna phases. Is Roman propaganda again tainting our views? I think he's thinking specifically of an incident in uh, Caesar's Gallic Wars where they burn people inside a, a, an effigy, if I recall correctly. I mean, there is a, a good deal of evidence that, you know, we talked about the Celt as menace, and it's a topos, it's a, it's a trope. There is some evidence that the Celt at time provides some pretty good ammunition for um, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, tropes, because their the human sacrifice does seem to have been a uh, part of some Celtic religions, again, not negating the, the diversity of the, the, the Celts, and an, an aspect of, again, headhunting is an aspect of, of Celtic warfare. Certainly, just I, as with the Romans, um, we would imagine that um, uh, religion is quite closely linked to war and violence. Um, we do suffer a bit from the fact that we just simply don't have great evidence for the particular <laughs> content of a lot of Celtic religious beliefs. No, and I suspect if, if you just project back into the, the ancient warrior's mindset, and I actually wrote the introduction for one of the issues where religion was the theme, um, what was very evident to me across across all Greek societies, across Roman society, and I'm going to project, and I'm treading on thin ice here, but I'm going to project against uh, the Iron Age Celtic societies, uh, a, an idea that there is a spirit world which is taking place in parallel with our current living world, and that the gods intervene, and that, for example, you can do things to placate them before you start the battle, uh, there's a certain element of, well, when you're in the thick of battle, it really is in the hands of the gods. And at the end of it, who survives then, you know, thanks their gods with spoils and trophies and so on. And those who fall are assumed to then be taken care of by the gods. So I think there's an idea that the spirit world and religion envelops everything that the warrior does. I guess maybe it might be time to finally say uh, the D word, um, druid, um, as e even though that I, I think can be very dangerous. Um, Certainly through Caesar, who does seem to have a druid as one of his um, uh, sources, um, you know, we do get some insight to um, this particular brand of Celtic religion found in parts of um, particularly Gaul and Britain. We don't have much evidence that they're druids anywhere else. Um, but interestingly enough, one thing about being a druid is if you are a druid, you are uh, excused from warfare. You don't fight. 
um, which is very different from, say, the Romans, where Caesar is conquering Gaul as literally the Pontifex Maximus. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a uh, somewhat interesting idea that, that there are groups of Celts who see certain forms of religious uh, practice as being separate or antithetical even to um, uh, people going out and, and being warriors. It's interesting, the parallel I was going to say there, Michael, in Israel I believe the ultra-Orthodox Jews also have basically an exception that they don't have to join the army, which is something that the Israeli societies are now trying to change. So, that, so even in that society, very ancient tradition, there's an assumption that ultra-Orthodox people don't need to uh, fight. Yeah, now that being said, we also do have some evidence uh, coming from, and this is coming from Tacitus, that Druids are involved in uh, resistance to the Romans, and this is a very kind of dramatic depiction of the Romans storming um, uh, the island of Mona in, uh, off the coast of Wales, and supposedly the Druids are there on the beach as so the Roman assault boats come in, and they're doing what, you know, for the Romans is a bunch of hoodoo voodoo. Um, now, again, this is a probably pretty... Um, uh, dramatic and probably embellished count, but there is some evidence that for at least this element of, of resistance on this island that um, some Druids were um, rather critical in, in, organizing the, in organizing the resistance. Although, again, we also know of Druids who are very friendly to Caesar and welcome his, uh, him and his legions in, so um, it, it, it all depends. Um, but certainly that is uh, one aspect of, uh, of Celtic religion, at least as, as uh, for the Celts that Caesar encounters in the 50s BC. Taking up the, uh, the, uh, the Mona, which is Annus Morn, by the way, in Welsh, uh, is I think that recently, probably in the last five years, uh, all the evidence was uncovered, which I, if I got this right, was, was bones of children, I think, or young men. And uh, the, the interpretation given is, is that at that time in 6059 AD, uh, with, with the Romans basically cornering them, uh, that they're basically people who are starving, they're, they're, they're in, a, in a very stressed state, and what they have to do basically is perform a, a, a sort of human sacrifice at this point in an attempt to placate the gods to try and turn the tide for them. Uh, clearly it doesn't work because you know, the, the rest of history tells us that that didn't happen, but uh, again, I think there's an understanding that there's this level of religion which informs decisions that people make, like many old societies, of course. Yeah, and, and certainly human sacrifice is part of uh, Celtic religious practice, at least for some groups. And, uh, you know, all these bodies that turn up in bogs are other examples of, for some reason, um, uh, people being sacrificed. You can only kind of speculate as to, as to why, but um, it was related to the stress of uh, Roman invasion um, is uh, probably not necessarily unwarranted. Um, and actually human sacrifice, you know, the, the Romans um, very rarely meddle with the religious practices of people that they have uh, incorporated into their empire. And one of the rare um, uh, exceptions does seem to be um, laws uh, prohibiting uh, sort of progressively the practice of uh, Druidism, which is maybe one reason why we just don't know as much about um, uh, Celtic religion as we'd uh, like to. Yeah, I, I do find it rather a contradiction that, uh, for example, the Romans seem to have made the, the Druid a I don't know, the, the ultimate fiend, if you like, and, and the fact that they practice this, you know, this human sacrifice, and yet this is the same society that institutionalizes gladiatorial fights, uh, mass executions. So it, it, it's, in a sense, the Romans have to have a legal basis to commit these kinds of atrocities, whereas because these other people presumably don't have a legal basis, they're, they're terrible people. It's, it's, it's an odd contradiction for me to try and work out. Yeah, I mean, the, and the Romans do... It, by the by, the early empire seemed to be developing a, a sort of much more uh, uh, negative view of human sacrifice. I mean, Caesar doesn't seem bothered at all that the Celts sacrifice people. Again, he's again has a druid who is probably a pretty good buddy. Um, but by Augustus, there does seem to be a feeling that human sacrifice is one area where the Romans should intervene in um, sort of religious practices amongst their subject peoples. And the Druids are uh, certainly uh, in the crosshairs as the most prominent practitioner. So there's some evidence of um, uh, crackdowns of, of human sacrifice in uh, North Africa as well. Uh, Yirki Holmer, uh, I, again, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, says, I've always found it hard to imagine someone really fighting completely naked. You will feel really unprotected. I find the explanations that dirty clothing will enter the wounds with the blades and causing inflammation, etc., ridiculous. So is it just a colorful way of the Romans to describe the barbaric ways of the Celts, or what? No, I think it is as it's told. The, essentially, for example, as, as a, as a reenactor, I mean, um, 
one thing that, that I would get a lot of fun out of it is, of course, is rebuilding and wearing ancient armor, but it does does have consequences. It restricts you to certain ways. Um, you know, the Roman armor is designed to be so that it fights in formation with other with other people who have the same kit, largely. Uh, I think in, in Celtic society that there's, again, it, we were talking this about this religious thing, uh, there's this idea, the, the inner, um, what's the word I'm looking, the, it, um, the ability to be able to, uh, to just take on the opponent, literally naked. I mean, you are that fearless. Um, and, and I think that, that in its own way is intimidating the enemy. My God, the man turns out bollock naked on a battlefield ready to fight. Um, and if I can draw an analogy, apparently, uh, I think it was during the, uh, the, one of the early modern wars between Iran and Iraq, uh, you had the Iranian troops who had no arms at all would literally walk into the battlefield against Iraqi soldiers who had guns and all they had basically was a promise of an immortal life and they apparently you know they did, did this so I, I'm quite prepared to believe that there would be certain warriors who would be quite happy to fight naked um, the, the sense of it is I'm looking for a word uh, that, that Incivil invincibility. Invincibility. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. That's the word you're looking for. Yes. Of course, yeah. they were very, very thinking, forward thinking, uh, in the sense that they thought it was very easy for reenactors to uh, to copy. <laughs> yeah. Well, course, uh, most reenactments don't allow you to fight naked. It's a bit of a shame. Really. I I have actually there there have been photos in Roman army talk of. Um, of people who took their reenacting extremely seriously. I'll leave it at that. Joshua, you had another one. Uh, Tina Banerjee Chutum asks something that is already answered on the cover of this issue, I think. Did women sometimes fight in the Celtic army? Um, the, the short answer seems to be no. Um, uh, Boudicca is, is, again, kind of um, exceptional. But that is kind of part of a, another uh, stereotype about Celtic peoples, which is their women are really big and tough and almost sort of brutish. Um, and uh, we see that kind of throughout, even in the 4th century AD, um, when Gaul has been part of the Roman Empire for centuries and centuries, um, Ammianus Marcellinus writes about how tough um, uh, Celtic women are and how they, you know, go and get into fights and beat up men and things like that. Um, so that may be a bit of a, a, a Topos about the other is, you know, not only are the Celts uh, ferocious, um, but their their women are equally um, ferocious. Um, but that being said, the evidence for um, uh, women in the you know ranks of Celtic armies, I, I don't really think is is there. Well, I'll throw this in then, Michael, because of the two battles I'm thinking of, Rakelai, for example, and the final battle of Boudicca, as it turns out, uh, the women and the children turn up in in, in part of the baggage train. And they put the carts at the battle on the, the other end of the battlefield, so they can watch. The idea is that they're going to see their men folk win the battle, and they'll be able to celebrate. And they're there to cheer them on, in fact. And of course, in the case of both battles, it backfires because, when, in fact, they, they lose and they chase. They then block their way, and in fact, it's a slaughter. So I think that women are part of it, but as spectators. Yeah, and, and of course, some of that is the the Kimbri do seem to be, um, you know, they seem to be a society on the move, so they do have all of these. Um, uh, women, but that being said, that that also is an observation. For example, that Tacitus makes about the Germans that um, uh, the women go and uh, you know watch their men and you know cheer them on if they're doing well and are ready to chastise them if they are um, fighting poorly. Um, some of it probably has some uh, links to yeah, reality, and some of it again also maybe this kind of um, uh, classical topos of these. Uh, you know, just really tough women right there. You know, criticizing their warrior because he's not uh, you know chopping lustily enough with his broadsword. You know, I'm more willing to give the classical sources the benefit of the doubt and, and think that there's not so much a topos as that. Because if, if you think about it, that where we have got our information from would be, in the case of Berkeley, would be someone like Plutarch, who I understand was drawing on the biographies written by Sulla and Mar uh, uh, Marius and all these other people. So presumably, we don't have them uh, to know with any certainty, but those sorts of details of the battle would have been included. This is a question uh, posed by Lisa Phelps on behalf of Thomas Kassan. Uh, age 13, and I think we've already touched upon this, uh, but here goes. Did the Celts have any contact with Norsemen? Did they trade with them? Did they fight with them? And if they made contact, did the Norse religion have any effects on the Celtic tribes? Well, I guess it depends. I mean, there certainly are plenty of evidence of links between um, parts of uh, Scandinavia and 
you know, the broader northern Europe and the broader Mediterranean. Um, uh, this is where the amber comes from that um, is traded all the way down uh, across, uh, you know, many societies. Um, in terms of the um, uh, uh, Scandinavians being necessarily what we see as medieval Vikings, um, probably some similarities. They're, they're all in Iron Age society, not with the same level of, of organization that uh, medieval uh, Scandinavian society will have. Um, but actually, a lot of wonderful Celtic artifacts turn up in places like Denmark. There's uh, um, uh, certainly a lot of trade going back and forth, and there's debate about you know the the debate about whether the Kimbri were Celtic or not um, uh, really can't be settled. It's kind of the sources. And, you know, different people have different ideas in the ancient sources, but they supposedly do come from Denmark, so um, they, they may have been related to some of the uh, folks who start, uh, you know, smashing up the Irish monasteries in the uh, early Middle Ages. Uh, as an adjunct to that, I mean, one of the uh, news stories I, I covered in one of the issues, um, a, a young lady doing her PhD, I think, in either Sweden or Norway, uh, proposed that uh, the introduction of basically copies of Roman army axes sort of Delabra type axes, uh, had, had a profound impact on that society and it led to people building effectively uh, stonewalled hill forts and stuff. So um, if, if Roman weapons were having an effect, I would imagine their nearer neighbors, Celtic or otherwise, would certainly have. I think the one thing that's amazing is that as we, as we start to dig into some of these archaeological sites, it's just amazing where some of this stuff has come from. Uh, you know, they may have passed many hands to get there. Um, like, like you say, Michael, that the amber, I mean, you know, the, the, it must have been quite a supply chain, but the fact is stuff did move around and influences were made. Final question is a very specific one. Mike Evans asks, I'd like to know if some Celtic tribes in contact with the Greeks could acquire and operate siege equipment. Could they have acquired it? Possibly. Is there evidence for it? I don't know of any. I, 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 off the top of my head, can't think of any. Um, we do hear, for example, of the uh, uh, Dacians uh, being very interested in acquiring uh, uh, siege equipment, um, but um, I, I can't really think of, off the top of my head, an instance of Celts using um, uh, Greco-Roman technology. Um, there is one, one interesting thing is when Celtic um, auxiliaries do serve in the Roman army, um, they sometimes do things like go and take a catapult spring and drop it into a well. Um, so uh, in, in that instance, you have a, a soldier who still is you know, practicing some um, Celtic religious um, uh, rituals, but you're going to get uh, a Roman you know, catapult uh, part. Um, but I, can't, I, I, I actually don't think there's a lot of evidence, unless someone else... Uh, remember an example that's slipping my Michael, mind. Michael, no, I could think of, of a negative one. Um, if we th uh, we discussed the Batavians just now, uh, saying that they were possibly Batavia, uh, possibly um, Celtic, possibly Germanic, they have the greatest trouble when they're besieging uh, the fort at Vedera, and now Xanten, uh, to use any siege weapons at all. They don't seem to be good at it, and those guys were supposedly had been in the Roman army for years uh, and probably had close, had potentially close contact with them. Though I would imagine, but, though, because of the nature of that technology, I would imagine that the Roman, the citizen part of the army, would probably be very careful not to let that part of the uh, training get into the hands of other people who might use it against them. But the, the, the big story of the Batavian revolt is the Romans were so shocked by the fact that the Batavians were their trusted allies and had been... Uh, some of the Batavian units had been um, working with uh, the, uh, the 14th Legion, famously, for decades. So I, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a very specific question. I don't think you can probably say yes, they might have had... I would just say for the most part, no, for the, for the simple answer. <laughs> the, the Celts are very good at, um, yes, being, being ferocious and, and terrifying and uh, serving as, as light infantry and serving as cavalry. Um, but they're they're not uh, don't have a particular strength at, at siege um, warfare. They do they do manage to take Colchester and kill everybody, but it doesn't seem that, that uh, siege, siege uh, machine play much of a role in that. I think it was undefended. Perhaps on that note, we should um, call it a day. And I would like to thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Yosho, for your contributions today.